is misinformation out there that this virus perhaps was manufactured in some way. The idea that this virus escaped from the lab is just pure baloney. It's Say the lab leak theory, extremely unlikely. There is absolutely no evidence uh, to support that claim. We know now that the left's attempt to squash the lab leak theory was bullcrap. That this coronavirus was not man-made. That is not a possibility. I've shown you the evidence, the documents, the emails, the memos, the contracts that prove some of our nation's most distinguished researchers knew of COVID's origin from the beginning. So tonight we're gonna dive a little deeper into this story. We know of the lies. So now, what are the details behind the cover-up? Why were they so nervous about the lab leak theory? What did they fear would be exposed? Where did the massive funding of EcoHealth Alliance from the US government go? And who was involved? Because the insider you'll hear from tonight a former colleague to Peter Daszak says this web of lies goes back to the CIA. Tonight, white lies, black ops, and red China. Insider exposes pandemic money trails. Hello, America, and welcome. We did a COVID special a few months ago. I believe then we showed considerable proof that there was a cover-up going on during the opening weeks and months of the pandemic. The virus was spreading all over the world and people at the highest levels of bureaucracy and the scientific community appeared more interested in covering up their cooperation with China than responding to the outbreak. I asked then, why is that? Is it to hide the fact that the government owns a stake in the intellectual property rights of mRNA vaccines? I thought that was a pretty big deal. I thought it was a pretty big deal when we showed you the actual bank account at the Federal Reserve where that money's coming in. We went on Tucker Carlson's show, I did, um, to talk about it. He thought it was kind of a big deal. We both wondered, how is it this is not the biggest story in the world right now? Why isn't the mainstream media covering this round the clock? Sure, we're all just asking questions here, but is that not the job of the media? It seems at some point the media forgot their primary purpose to point out questionable behavior, present it to the public and ask the government, can you explain this? So in their absence, that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. I am still flabbergasted that everyone blew past the fact that the government owns a stake in the vaccines, the same vaccine that they tried to mandate everyone taking. How is this just business as usual? Now, we know a cover-up surrounding the lab leak theory took place. But I'm curious as to why still. Is there something much larger that they were trying to cover up? Tonight, maybe you can join us in asking the government, can you explain this? I want to show you a diplomatic cable that was sent from the U.S. Embassy in Beijing 2017. This is two years before the pandemic. It was never meant to be seen. It was marked sensitive, but it was recently released after a FOIA request. The topic of the cable was something that began back in 2016 called the Global Virome Project. This was primarily a US-directed initiative to collaborate with other world governments to predict the next global pandemic. Now, I want to emphasize the word predict because the diplomatic cable expl explains how the Global Virome, uh, Virome Project began. Let me quote, out of the PREDICT project of US aid, and it received over 130 million in US funding. So we have the US government directing our taxpayer dollars through USAID on PREDICT, a PREDICT project. And then it was being expanded through the Global Virome Project. Apparently the US State Department was interested in the expansion headed towards China. Okay, take Take note of a couple of things. Take note of the uh, involvement of USAID. 
That is the United States Agency for International Development. We're going to come back to them. But not only were the millions of dollars coming from USAID, most of the people leading the Global Virome Project were either former USAID people or they had been working on USAID projects. The chairman of the board came directly from USAID. Another board member came from USAID's PREDICT program and UC Davis. Remember that for later. And one more board member will sound familiar. Peter Daszak. Is there anything this guy isn't mixed up in? Well, then the pandemic happened. So either these guys all sucked at their job because their job was to look for the next pandemic, predict where it was, where it was coming from. They didn't have any idea. So do they suck at this? Possibly. Or, to ask a question, was that their primary purpose? Let me go back to the cable. Check out this one line. Absent U.S. government leadership in GVP agenda setting, governance and funding the Chinese government could likely take a leading position in this potentially path-breaking endeavor undermining years of U.S. government leadership. The heck, what did they just say? I think they just said, I mean, maybe. Was the government getting involved because they wanted to defeat a future pandemic? Or was this about spying on China? I wanted you to consider the people involved here. The millions in U.S. funds. USAID and now the State Department at the embassy in China. All of this was occurring two years before the pandemic, at ground zero of the pandemic. If spying on China ended up helping spread COVID, they would need to answer. I wonder, is this part of the cover-up? It's an honest question. Look, I want to say something I have twice in my career been on a line of questioning where I have received calls from people in the government who have said to me, Glenn, I can't tell you anything other than you are about to blow something for us. Please, we would ask that you might just hold off on this line of questioning and this expose for a little while. I have done that. I am a patriotic American. I understand that some things happen that our government doesn't want broadcast everywhere. We have not received any phone calls from the government. The government, if they want to be trusted and have that kind of relationship, which I know they have in the past with multiple broadcasters, they have to prove themselves to be trustworthy. This government has started with the noble lie and it is spiraled out of control. So let's try to piece together what might be happening here. Four months into the pandemic, COVID virus sequences were starting to be made public and Peter Daszak was nervous. We know this now due to a FOIA email from Daszak to his team and I quote, all It's extremely important that we don't have these sequences as part of our PREDICT release to uh, GenBank at this point. Now, remember, PREDICT was expanded via the genome or or the uh, Global Virome Project. And that, that was the one that the U.S. Embassy in China was so interested in. The U.S. Embassy, why would they be? Check out the next line. Having them part of PREDICT will be very unwelcome attention to UC Davis, PREDICT, and USAID. Why? Why would that be unwelcome attention? Consider the timeline here. This was in April of 2020. The pandemic was just starting to spread. We were all in lockdown. But the guy at the center of all of this was more worried about a paper trail leading back to his organization 
EcoHealth Alliance, and USAID. Everyone mentioned in this email, EcoHealth, USAID, PREDICT, and UC Davis were heavily represented back in 2017 for the Global Virome Project. The PREDICT website even lists the collaboration between USAID, UC Davis, and EcoHealth on the front page. That's where the paper trail leads. It's also what the State Department was so interested in. But as per the diplomatic cable, stopping a pandemic didn't appear to be the government's main worry. Losing ground to China, however, was. So now the question is, how far were they willing to go to ensure China didn't leap ahead of the United States in biotech? How deep into the bowels of this U.S. government does this go? Were they trying to stop biotech? Let me ask you this question. If we could put a scientist into the nuke plant of Iran, and he was actually a CIA member, would that be worth it? Would that be a good idea? Sure. Sure. If they were there to alert us, hey, they're getting close, and then we could stop them. But if that CIA agent was there helping them, giving them information, and then they launched the nuke, and that's when he was like, oh, by the way, they're very close to launching that nuke, that would be a very bad idea, right? Which one is it? Or is it none of these? I'm going to introduce you here in a minute to somebody who says he knows. Back in a minute. If you're one of the millions of Americans who suffer every day from pain, I want you to listen up. There is hope, and it comes in the form of relief factor. Every day I read testimonials of people who've tried Relief Factor for their pain and gotten their life back. I know because it has happened firsthand to me. A few years ago, I would have been sitting here um, trying to hide my pain. Today, I don't have to. My hands work. They're steady and it's great. When I started taking Relief Factor, I got my life back. If um, you are like I used to be. If just getting through your day is a challenge due to pain, please try Relief Factor. Try it. Get the three-week quick start now. Try it for $19.95. 70% of the people who try it go on to order more. Drug-free and natural way to get your life back. It's relieffactor.com. That's relieffactor.com. You know, I... I, I, I want to go back a step because I, I, I think I put the cart before the horse. Let me try to break this down for you. Everybody is scrutinizing EcoHealth Alliance, and they are looking at the government funding from one source, Fauci's NIH. But those funds, we have now found out, are merely a drop in the bucket compared to the total amount of U.S. tax dollars that have been given. And Peter Daszak himself has said that 80% of the funding comes from the government. So where else beside the NIH has money been coming from? Well, The Intercept is doing a great job. They've obtained federal funding information from EcoHealth from 2004 to 2022. During that time, they received nearly $16 million from the Department of Health and Human Services, which includes grants from the NIH and NIAID. But I want to show you the largest sources of funding. Where are they from? By far, the largest donors are from USAID and the Department of Defense? Nearly $54 million from USAID, that is pretty tied up with the State Department, and $42 million from DOD. Why have we been focusing on HHS and Fauci? 
The HHS dollars at least can be explained, but USAID and the Pentagon? Today, EcoHealth Alliance is at the center of the lab leak theory, and they've heavily embedded themselves in governments all over the world researching viruses. But that actually has nothing to do with what the company was founded to do. In fact, EcoHealth Alliance isn't even its original name. It began as a conservation organization called Wildlife Trust. But in 2010, they rebranded and shifted focus. This is a FOIA grant proposal obtained by The Intercept between then Wildlife Trust and Health and Human Services. I want to read you a line from the proposal explaining the significance of Peter Daszak's research. Quote, Two of these newly emerged viruses, HEV and NIV, are not only novel discoveries, but they are also BSL-4 agents that possess several biological features that make them highly adaptable for use as bioterror agents. Hmm. So, were we looking to stop future pandemics or were we looking for bioweapons? The grant proposal goes on to list the multiple countries that they were operating in. Remember that FOIA diplomatic cable mentioned cooperation with countries like Jeddah in order to ensure that they didn't leapfrog the US, uh, US of A. So this would at least partly explain why the Pentagon was now interested in EcoHealth and willing to give them $42 million in funding. This is another FOIA EcoHealth grant proposal for 2017. In this one, um, you can see that they appear to be involved with the United States Defense Threat Reduction Agency. In fact, on the very first page of this proposal, it says, quote, cooperative counter weapons of mass destruction research with global partners. Have we been on a wild goose chase this whole time? Has this government, does this government even know what the truth is anymore? Was this about stopping a future pandemic, as they have said, or was this about spying in other countries to stop bioweapons? Like I said, a good citizen would know that sometimes the government has to do things that they don't want on the front page of the papers. I've listened to the 1960 speech by uh, John F. Kennedy. I know our responsibility, but that requires a government that is honest with its people. I don't know what the truth is anymore. I do know that the Pentagon was involved due to their funding. We also know that the State Department was involved due to the message from the embassy in Beijing. That lines up with the other State Department program, State Department programs that are there to root out bioweapons. The Office of Cooperative Threat Reduction. Gee, what's that? Well, it was established after the Cold War to seek, seek out and prevent nations from acquiring weapons of mass destruction, including bioweapons. I'm glad they exist, okay? I just would like to know what's really going on. This has cost millions of lives. And if they were there to wipe out bioterrorist weapons, and this wasn't a weapon, okay, fine. Could they have said something like, hey, there was a lab accident? I mean, let the world know. Are they just really bad at their job? Was this a bioweapon? What is the truth? If EcoHealth's work was just about health, wouldn't the funding come just from HHS and the NIH? Because they're all about health. Now, maybe there is a good explanation, but we should at least be able to get some explanation. Beyond the Department of Defense, the largest funder by far was USAID. 
And that's interesting because USAID has a very long history with an intelligence agency. You might have heard of it called the CIA. Father George Cotter, Catholic priest that worked on a humanitarian project or several in South America, called USAID the CIA's little sister, that it was a, quote, graduate school for CIA agents. He said, quote, the idea was to plant operatives in every kind of activity we had overseas, government, volunteer, religious, every kind. The CIA can't even hide it anymore. It's insane. You can actually go to CIA.gov and read all, read all the FOIA information where they've been caught red-handed. Look at this. This is the FOIA um, CIA involvement through USAID to operate Air America in the 1970s. Here's the 1976 report to Congress detailing USAID's work with the CIA to train foreign police forces in, quote, you're going to love this, terror and torture techniques, end quote. Getting caught in the 1970s didn't seem to have changed USAID's activity. They were recently outed funding a social media platform to try to destabilize Cuba. From 2012 to 2016, USAID gave George Soros Open Society Foundation nearly five million taxpayer dollars. I'm sure it's purely coincidental that Soros at the time was attempting to influence and overthrow Macedonia's conservative government. Why is it our tax dollars went through USAID to be involved with that? Time and time again. They have proven to be yet another arm of the intelligence community that doesn't really seem to be on the same page with the American people. Many times, many times they're working directly with the CIA. And now USAID is the largest source of U.S. government funds to the man and the company that keeps finding himself and itself at the center of the pandemic. Peter Daszak and EcoHealth Alliance. It's odd. It's inconvenient. It's almost like lightning striking the same point a thousand times. All right. So why am I bringing this up to you? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> what, the government's lying to us? And what are they going to say? It's another conspiracy theory. Okay, all right. Well, I don't know what the truth is. I don't, I don't have any idea. I know where this kind of leads us, and it's not really good. But tonight we have an insider at EcoHealth Alliance. He has recently gone public, and he has said that Peter Daszak disclosed to him that he was working with the CIA. I know what you're thinking, because I was thinking the same thing. But we reached out to him, and we looked into his story. His name is Dr. Andrew Huff. We have verified that he was, in fact, a vice president at EcoHealth Alliance. We reached out to colleagues of his at EcoHealth that vouched for his character. Dr. Huff has made multiple whistleblower complaints and now has begun reaching out to members of Congress. We also reached out to Peter Daszak of EcoHealth. I have been trying to get these people on the horn for, oh, months. They don't even, I, don't, I thought for a minute there they didn't have telephones or email because they've never responded to us ever. But it's interesting. They gave us this response quickly. Um, I'm gonna give this to you here, um, but they say all the stuff you're about to hear is baseless. Maybe it is. Is it baseless? Is it baseless, as Peter Daszak or uh, EcoHealth says, or does Dr. Huff have proof? I'm going to give him the uh, time and the ability to back up his story. He's coming up after the break. So why does this matter? Well, it's, we have to know the truth, for one. And it's wild to me that nobody has even looked into EcoHealth funding outside the money that came from Fauci's NIH and HHS. 
Given USAID's shady history as an intelligence arm, I think we should explore this. USAID just announced a $125 million expansion of their virus hunting program. They were there in Wuhan. I don't think they can find them. They failed at predicting the last pandemic. We're going to give them more money? You could actually make the argument that they made things worse. At any rate, they plan on pushing forward. If the CIA, USAID, State Department, and the Department of Defense were all watching Wuhan for all these years, how can they stay silent on the lab leak theory? How can they sit there looking shocked as the pandemic swept out of Wuhan? What did they know? How much aid did we actually give while all these agencies were collaborating with the Chinese? All these questions need to be answered. And we start next with the EcoHealth Insider. Stand by. All right, I want to talk to you about, well, anything, anything at all that is better than working out. Um, everything, everything's better than working out. Everything is better than eating a really lousy protein bar, too. Eating healthy. Oh, I had a whole bunch of rabbit food today. It was delicious. <laughs> Built Bar is a protein bar. That's what they claim. Uh, but to me, it will always be a candy bar. They taste really good, and I've got a wicked professional sweet tooth. I can eat a Built Bar without feeling guilty. I can eat a Built Bar without thinking it's good for me. Most Built Bars have about 130 calories, only 4 grams of sugar, 4 grams of net carbs, 17 grams of protein. But they're also made uh, with 100% real chocolate. Mm. They have amazing flavors. You're going to love them. Time to get rid of all those snacks um, and all those horrible protein bars that taste like crap. If you're uh, looking at your waistline, and I can't look at it because I can't see. It's so enormous now. Um, use... Built. Go to Built.com right now. Built Bar. They are really good. Built.com. Use the promo code BEC15 and save 15%. Built.com. Joining me now is the current co-founder and CEO of the medical technology firm Metrix. He is also the author of an upcoming book, The Truth About Wuhan. Keep that in mind. His perspective is definitely interesting to what really went on at the Wuhan lab. I don't know what the truth is. He was a former senior scientist and associate vice president at EcoHealth Alliance. He worked with Peter Daszak. Dr. Andrew Huff is his name. Welcome, Dr. Huff. How are you? I'm fantastic. How about yourself? Very good. Um, so um, how long were you at EcoHealth Alliance and what, were you, what was your job title and what you did there? Sure. So I was hired in October of 2014, and I worked there until July of 2016. I was hired as a senior scientist where it was my job to take over uh, what I came to learn, a failing department in data and technology. So we were building biosurveillance tools uh, for alphabet soup of U.S. government agencies. The primary customer was the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. I successfully brought in uh, roughly about $4.6 million of funding. Uh, in June of 2015, the contract was fi finalized, and I was promoted to vice president at EcoHealth. Was that what you thought your job was when you when you first started? Well, um, actually, I was totally in love with EcoHealth Alliance when I when I first started. I was working at Sandia National Laboratories as a senior mem <clears throat> member of the technical staff, and I was tired of my work uh, getting classified. And when you're in the federally funded research and development center world, uh, working in classified biosurveillance type work, you can get stuck there. And I was worried that that would happen to me. Uh, so I started looking for other positions and I found this organization called EcoHealth Alliance and they had a, this great mission where they were trying to protect and conserve wildlife and the environment uh, with the hope of preventing infectious disease emergence, which has some validity to it. Uh, what I came to learn over time, uh, it was, that was not the case. Uh, okay, because, I mean, what we have been pursuing is their goals on that, to try to um, find emerging viruses and then, you know, figure out ways to cure them before they, they hit uh, the mainstream. 
and, and you're saying that that's not what they do. No, not at all. And some of this is retrospect after what I realized after the COVID-19 emergence and then reflecting back about at, at my time at Equal Health Alliance. Uh, much of the work that we were focused on was primarily hunting for viruses, specifically coronaviruses internationally. It seemed like a coronavirus uh, fishing expedition uh, to me. They were making big claims through the USAA PREDICT program that they were going to be able to predict and forecast pandemics. Uh, while working at EcoHealth Alliance, I came to the conclusion that they weren't collecting the right data and they weren't applying the right methods or the correct methods to actually actually be able to accurately predict uh, pandemics. And now why would you, you say know, why would you why would you say that without I mean talk dumb to us we're not the talk down to us you have our permission we're not scientists. <laughs> Um, no, I never talked down to, have you used my students? So I, yeah. I never talked down to students. Okay. Uh, so uh, quite simply in the scientific method, uh, you would, you would generate hypotheses and you would, you'd want to compare all the different viruses that exist. And there's roughly 26 classes of viruses or families that exist. And so to, to figure out which viruses would have the most pandemic potential, you'd actually have to make comparisons between all these different classes of viruses. Uh, the PREDICT program did look at other uh, species of viruses other than coronaviruses, but not many. And that, that's where you would start. So you, you'd eliminate the pandemic potential by, by first comparing all these different agents. Then after you made those comparisons, you'd sort of narrow down the pile, so to speak, of viruses you wanted to look at. And then after you did that, you'd have to actually then look at the, the transmission factors for those diseases. So um, how likely would it be that that disease would spill over into a human population and then have sustained transmission enough to cause a pandemic? Uh, oftentimes, there are, there are many spillover events or infectious disease outbreaks are happening all the time. Uh, they come in different forms. Uh, and typically, they, they fizzle out and they burn out. So you need to have very robust systematic data collected on a routine systematic basis over time. And spatially, you'd have to be collecting disease samples from all over the planet. Um, and what, what it looked like to me, or what it appeared to be, was that we were cherry picking locations of where we were collecting these data, uh, probably for a variety of reasons. And what were those reasons? Well, this is speculation on my part. <laughs> so okay. this is not this is not not fact. Uh, much of my speculation is supported, but by, by many of the documents in my possession. But it would be places where we want to collect uh, intelligence uh, on foreign laboratory capacity uh, globally. So I do hold, or I used to hold, a top secret clearance in this space. So there's some things I have to be careful, which I, that, sure. that it, I might know that I can't speak about. Mm -hmm. But it does does seem that it would be the type of thing of type of places where. We'd want to collect information on laboratory capacity, the places where we're working, the, the places where people would be doing infectious disease work, uh, the type of work they're doing, and what capabilities do they have inside those laboratories. So this seems to me to be money well spent if you stop things like the coronavirus. Um, it, uh, it seems like money well spent, so we know exactly you know, we, we did this in World War II. We would send people over as spies to, to get in and find out exactly what they knew, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that's fine as a, as a country, except this time it sucks. I mean, they, they, they didn't do their job if that's what they were doing. This looks to me to be the biggest intelligence failure in U.S. history, unfortunately. And the reason why I say an intelligence failure um, one of the interesting things that, that I have in my possession, which I've released to, to journalists, is something called an Incutel pitch deck. So in October of 2015, uh, Dr. Peter Dasick came to me and asked me to add slides to a pitch deck, which was for Incutel. Uh, for your audience who, who, who might not know or understand what Incutel is, Incutel is an independent venture capital firm, which is backed by the CIA, uh, the Department of Defense, uh, the Geospatial Intelligence Agency, I think it's been, been renamed, uh, the intelligence community at large. And the way it works is they usually pump a few million dollars into the company in exchange for whatever the product is that they're delivering. In the Incutel pitch deck, um, basically they are selling the SARS-CoV-2 surveillance work and also the gain of function work in the proposal as the main uh, body of product 
which they'd be investing into, which would be both intelligence collection and uh, bioweapons development as defined by Dirk and gain of fu function policy at the time. So we looked at this, and I, I don't know exactly what we're looking for, but it doesn't have any Incutel um, markings or, or uh, anything. Like, for instance, you have one from IARPA. IARPA, yes, that's the IARPA. Intelligence Advanced. That's the Intelligence Advanced Research Project Agency. Okay. So I actually maintained all the continuity of those files. And if you have a forensic person take a look at it, they haven't been altered um, since they've been in my possession. Right. And okay, so but this the, one, hang on just a second. This one sure. does, it's clearly marked for that agency, but this one doesn't. I mean, what, what smoking gun do you have in the uh, uh, Incutel? Well, it's the, it's the file path name, actually, that was named by Dr. Dasik. So if you actually look at the file path, it says Dr. Dasik. And then if you look at the um, the edit history on the file, which hasn't been edited, okay. it clearly states Peter Dasik, Incutel, Pitch Deck, October Okay, 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 okay. Um, did Peter Dasik ever tell you that he was part of CIA? Well, this was the weirdest, one of the weirdest nights of my life, actually. Uh, so late in 2015, Dr. Dasik and I still had a very good relationship. And we were leaving uh, work late at night. We were both working on grant, grant proposals. We were probably leaving the office somewhere between 9.30 and 10 p.m. at night. And that's when the office was on 34th Street in New York. I used to live up on 45th Street. And uh, Dr. Dasik uh, commuted into town uh, in his car. And he had a parking space about a block away. So as we're leaving the, the building, uh, we walk into the vestibule. And he says, hey, Andrew, uh, do you mind if I ask you a question? And, you know, this is my, my boss asking me a question. He, sure, Peter, uh, go ahead. Uh, what do you got? And he asked me, well, someone from the CIA approached me. Do you think it's a good idea if we work with them? And I was absolutely shocked. So first of all, um, I had worked in national security my whole career all, um, as a soldier, um, then also as a scientist, and I'd been in the space. So typically, you don't ask these questions to somebody who hasn't been read into the program. Uh, for your audience, that means it's a formal process where uh, someone with the clearance is sort of told about the boundaries of what they can or can't talk about with a classified program. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is that I had no idea to believe that Dr. Dasik possessed a security clearance. And at the time, uh, my, my security clearance uh, was uh, revoked uh, because I was no longer working in the laboratory. So it could have been reactivated as still within the seven year time period uh, for it to be reactivated, but it was no longer active. So I in initially had a shocked reaction and I said, Peter, uh, it never hurts to talk with them. There could be money in it. And he sort of rambled about the people and places of where we were working. Then we made small talk, got on the elevator, uh, went down to the, the first floor. I walked Peter back to his car, and I continued my walk back up to 45th Street. Okay, hang uh, on just a second. I need to take a break, and then you tell us what this means to you. And, um, well, let's just take a break and come right back. So I just want to make sure that I understand your charge, um, that... EcoHealth was working with the CIA or with the State Department, uh, or you think they might be? Um, is, that, is that the charge? Well, my speculation is that they've actually been working with the intelligence community right out in the open. Um, and from that perspective, it's, it's genius. Uh, after 9/11, one of the major deficiencies. After 9/11, one of the major deficiencies identified in the 9/11 Commission report is that there is a substantial lack of human intelligence collection mm -hmm. capability in the CIA, and that leads to 9/11. Uh, one of the other deficiencies is specifically around bio, the bio threat and bioterrorism. So, if you look at what EcoHealth Alliance was doing in terms of the USAID pr program. Um, the communications going back and forth with the State Department, the Department of Defense, and multiple agencies tied to the intelligence community, it does look to be a giant intelligence collection okay. effort. Okay, so then you are a patriotic American, I'm a patriotic, uh, a patriotic American. If you're seeing this and it's good, um, why are you exposing it now? 
Well, obviously, it's a huge intelligence failure. So if, if, look at it this way. If we have Dr. Peter Daszak and other people from EcoHealth Alliance uh, who are closely tied to the Wuhan Institute of Virology, and somehow uh, there's a laboratory leak or potentially an intentional release of this agent, um, there was no early warning of that. Uh, furthermore, there's another weird thing that happened in my life in September of 2019. I was contacted by a person that I know is affiliated with the CIA and Department of Defense, who I met uh, as a PhD student at the University of Minnesota at a Department of Homeland Security Center of Excellence where I did my research. I knew this person was affiliated with a program called Argus Bio, and she contacted me uh, when I was an executive at Jewel Labs and offered and heavily pressured me to apply for a position as a program manager at DARPA. Um, mm. At the time, I was making really good money. Uh, we had three different phone conversations where she asked me to consider it. I spoke with my wife, Emily, about it, and I had declined the offer. I thought it was very strange. It was random. It was out of the blue. Um, but I believe that indicates that the U.S. government knew that something or had leaked in Wuhan as far back as September 2019. Uh, and the reason why they contacted me was so that they could read me into the program and get me um, a top secret clearance again. They'd read me in, and then I'd no longer be able to speak because I'm the only person uh, that's an outsider and, and right. not subject to influence in this whole entire mess. Okay. So do you think that we helped the Chinese? Did we give them technology that has now helped advance their program? Oh, absolutely. If you look at the, the research and publication trail and look no further than the Lancet letter with Peter Daszak where he's been recused, right. all of those different scientists have conflicts of interest either with the U.S. government uh, related to gain-of-function work, virology, uh, definitely with the USAID program and EcoHealth. They're all conflicted, all of them. Um, and if you then look at the different documents that I have in my possession and what's already available, uh, all these people had close ties to the Wuhan Institute of Virology. So once again, if this was such a great intelligence collection program, how did we miss it? It's, it's just, it's an epic failure. Um, you also brought up charges that uh, there was financing problems, illegal activity. Can you talk to me about that? It, yeah, I mean, it, it was sort of shocking to me. So I, I used to work for the Department of Veterans Affairs um, as an office manager, a program assistant, and I was a contracts technical representative for the U.S. government. And what that means is I was trained on contracting law and process, and I was managing it from the government side. Well, uh, after I was promoted to vice president uh, at Equal Health Alliance, one of my research assistants came to me and asked me if she could move my travel expenses from contract A to contract B, even though they were actually for contract A. And that I, I found that, you know, concerning. Yeah. And I didn't really know what to do at the time. And you can't really go to approach your boss at the finance department. The request came from the finance department. And I just sort of turned a blind eye to it. I probably should have spoke up. And actually, I did it at a later time. Um, in a quite a, a crazy turn of events, I got into a heated argument with uh, Dr. Daszak, the CFO, Harvey Kasdan, and Alexi Chimura about the financing of my department and salaries because I was worried about losing uh, employees to the likes of Google and Facebook. I had a lot of data scientists, engineers, software engineers, and I was even arguing for a pay raise for myself. And uh, in, a heat, in the heat of the moment, I, I uh, called the organization out on the financial fraud that I was witnessing. And uh, Harvey Kasdan uh, went home and had a heart attack and died uh, sometime over the next two days. I actually left on a plane to uh, Europe the, that next day because I was a coordinator to uh, the UN for uh, the USA AID project for food and modeling analytics. But I, I, you can't make this stuff up. I, um, we, we reached out to EcoHealth and said that you were going to be on the program. Um, we have reached out to them multiple times uh, over the last year, and uh, we never get anything back. We got something back quickly from them on you. It says, Dr. Huff was a member of EcoHealth Alliance staff during his short tenure, September 2014, April 2016, when he worked on analysis to better predict pandemics. In recent months, he's made a number of allegations of unethical or illegal activity by EcoHealth Alliance, all of which are demonstrably false. His claim that EcoHealth Alliance worked with the CIA is baseless. 
His claims about improprieties in our financial practices are also untrue. Our audit results and financial data are made public for uh, all to review and can be found at uh, ecohealthalliance.org slash financials strategy. Well, I can let the documents speak for themselves. Uh, EcoHealth can say whatever it wants. I have the documents in my possession. I've shared them with another number of journalists. Uh, I'm going to do a sworn deposition under oath because I can't get Congress or uh, the Senate to have me come in and testify. Why? I'm working with Tom. Why do you suppose? <laughs> Well, this is this is a terrible tragedy tra tragedy for the country. It spans multiple administrations. Um, a ban on gain of function is going to be a huge uh, financial hit for academic institutions globally in the U U.S. Uh, the U.S. is partly to blame for the deaths of millions of people worldwide. I mean, this is this is a terrible situation, and I don't believe anyone from the U.S. government wants to have their fingerprints on it or be um, in power uh, if they're elected officials when the truth comes out. And everyone is kicking the can down the road um, at this point. And the reality is, I think um, the Democrats, you know, I hate for this to be political, but a lot of it has been politicized. politicized. The Democrats don't want this to happen on their watch. And they're hoping that maybe, you know, they can kick the can down the road so it happens on the next administrations or the next Congress's uh, watch, so uh, to speak. Do you feel safe? I mean, you know, you're ratting out the CIA, possibly, if that, what you say is true. Oh, that's totally fine. Um, they've been harassing me for a number of months, actually. Uh, my house has been broken into. Um, my device has been hacked. They stole hard drives from my house trying to um, harass me in a number of different do ways. Have, and, do you have police uh, reports that we could verify that? Absolutely. Okay. Um, so if after the show, I can put you in contact with the local law enforcement, both the county okay. sheriff's department, and state police. I actually went to the FBI when this started happening and uh, with my <laughs> wife. <laughs> yeah, you laugh. And, and, that, and that was probably a mistake. Um, yeah. And actually, I have proof that the FBI lied to me uh, about what was going on. It actually went so far as that the U.S. Coast Guard actually hovered a helicopter over my house. And with the harassment, I actually didn't know who was doing it at first. I suspected the Chinese and uh when the, they hovered the helicopter over my house, um, it became apparent that it was the U.S. government. And simultaneously, uh, you can speak with the other person I referred you to from EcoHealth. They hovered uh, helicopters over his house as at, well at the exact same time his brother mm -hmm. was a witness to this. Uh, okay. So, Doctor, this I, is the I hate to cut you off, but I've got a network yeah. break. I thank you for uh, speaking and speaking up, and we'll let the people decide. God bless. We will do follow up on this on the Friday exclusive coming this Friday. Uh, also, if you missed today's radio program or the podcast, it is a don't miss. We had the former COO uh, from PayPal on talking about social credit in the United States. See you tomorrow. Good night.